one of the most brilliant and courageous actions conducted by a battalion since World War II. That's how the Battle of Goose Green was officially described today. And we heard the Defence Secretary, John Knott at the time, telling the whole world that 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment was poised, ready to attack the settlement of Goose Green. And the Harrier pilots said, don't worry about the superintendents. 600 British paratroops managed to capture more than twice their own number of Argentines. Spud, how are you, brother? Pretty good, buddy. Pretty good. I've got a message in front of me. What do I do with that? Got it. Okay, yes. Yeah, start again. I've got rid of it. <laughs> that's, that's okay. <laughs> Was it saying, are you talking to that handsome Mr. Thrill yeah. today? Yeah, Mr. Royal Marine, they said, that, that warrior, that warrior of truth. Yes. It's funny, Spud, obviously, like yourself, I'm really proud to have been a Royal Marine and it, yeah. and it, it meant a real special part of my life. But we, I know we're not going to talk about this, but the whole global uh, sphere at the moment means that every time people ask me for advice on the Royal Marines, I have to add the caveat, like, do, do you really know what you're going in? <laughs> yeah, in, yeah. In, in, and I, I hate doing it because I don't, I don't want to steal any young, young person's dreams. No. But um, it's a crazy world. And uh, I think very few people see, you know, the deeper implications of, of everything we do, you know, we make yeah. well, well, when I talk to the young lads in the regiment up here or the Paris, they or some some of them want to they fancy joining, I say, well, or they're in, I just say, look, lawyer up. And they say, What do you mean lawyer up? Because they're naive. Um and I said, You've you've only got to look back to Dennis Hutchinson, you know, 70, 70 odd year old man being hounded by the by the uh, government, which they could have stopped. And he actually died when he was on trial in Northern Ireland. Absolutely disgusting. So, yeah, I tell him to lawyer up. Um, and, of course, when we served, it was a different time, uh, different different politics. Uh, it was less complicated, a, loss, a, lot comp a less complicated world. And in particular, the Falklands War was probably the last um, straight war from my end anyway, that we ever thought, I know there was shenanigans going on the back with the searching for the, the fifth Exocet missile that the French had sold the Argentinians and stuff like that. And that was, that's quite a good story in itself. But uh, for my part, uh, being a grandoon on the ground, being in the parachute regiment, um, that's where my story, I can tell my story from. Yes. And we're going to do that. So Spud, your, um, so friends at home, Nigel Spud, uh, Ely, uh, uh, was two para down in the Falklands. We're going to come on and talk about his goose green experience. Uh, Nige famously went on, well, not famously because these guys like to keep it all quiet, but when yeah. it, it, you know, it's fair to, to give this man the credit he's due that he joined the special air service, which, uh, uh, certainly makes you in a, a, a minority elite on this planet. But you've just released a book, Goose Green. What, what, why, what was your reason for that, Spud? Well, um, I'd written a screenplay about my experiences of Goose Green, and uh, we were meant to start shooting that in um, February, March 2020. That was started, but then COVID kicked in. But I'd already started the book roughly the same time. It put me, took me four years to put together these stories of the one battle, the particular battle, the battle for Goose Green. Um, and I went around the country interviewing uh, over 200, but I eventually uh, narrowed it down to 114 guys. And then I took 64 testimonials from them, which equates in the book over 330 stories and vignettes about their particular experience of Goose Green. The, uh, uh, at the beginning, during the battle and after. And when I say after, I mean uh, way after, even today. So I've interviewed them about their experiences, their post-traumatic stress. Um, some of them have it bad. 
and some don't have it at all. So that's basically what it is. And for, for, for your viewers and listeners, Goose Green, the Battle for Goose Green was 40 years ago. It's for, it was 40 years ago on the 28th of May. And um, it was the decisive battle, but we didn't know that at the time. It was the first victory. And uh, two parallel went on to get a, to, to get a second victory at Wireless Ridge. But the book focuses on uh, the guys, and not necessarily the powers, the Marines, Royal Marines, uh, the civilians on board the ship, the Norland, which was the uh, roll-on, roll-off ferry, which took two para down. Um, and generally, it's, uh, I mean, I can, it's a book you can pick up and put down because the, uh, the, the way I've laid it out in chronological order but um, they're short stories. I think the longest one is of, a, of an officer, Captain uh, Farah, who, uh, <laughs> well, you know what the officers do, but he's very, uh, he's very succinct in, 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 in his uh, narrative. And I deliberately interviewed from Captain Down. I didn't do the company commanders, a major and a bomb, purely because they, they've told their story so many times, and, and quite rightly so, that you know, their stories needed to be told from a command level. But I wanted to get into the nitty-gritty, the, the, you know, the, the business end of it all. And uh, from Captain Down is where it happens. You know. mm. The only proviso I got from that was, of course, uh, Chris Keeble, who, uh, Major Chris Keeble, who took over the battalion when Colonel H. Jones got killed for the Battle for Darwin Hill, which was the vicious battle just before we went into Goose Green. Yes, and doesn't everybody remember that moment in time? Uh, everyone is old enough to remember it. It was 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 shocking moment, wasn't it? And, and, and oh. uh, for the Paras to suffer the loss of their boss and then just to get over it and keep fighting was... yeah. Just. Well, I, of course, of course. Before the day before on the twenty seventh, I mean, before that, we'd been on Sussex Mountains, freezing our asses off for four or five days, seeing the Navy get pummeled. I mean, it was a for a young paratrooper, a young soldier on that mountainside, looking at our great Royal Navy getting pummeled by the Argentine Air Force was 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 awful to see that because we were brought up to believe the Royal Navy ruled the world, and here we saw these ships getting burnt and. The, you know, Type 42 destroyers. And then we heard that the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic conveyor got bombed with all our kit on and helicopters and, you know, all the Arctic kit was on and rations. And it was just a dreadful time. And we were going down with trench foot. Some of the lads were going down with trench foot, uh, frostbite, you know, been exposed to the elements. Uh, and Jones, Colonel Jones says, we've got to get off this mountain. Um, and all due respect to Brigadier Julian Thompson, General Thompson now, who was the commander of three, Commander Brigade, who is a Royal Marine, uh, sort of said to Jones, you know, you've got to go. You've got to get off the mountain, you know. Uh, and that's what we did. We ended up in a place, uh, after about four days, we ended up in a place called Committed Creek House, which is several Ks short of Goose Green. That was our objective. We were going to attack on a six-phase um, plan. And... We were going to attack uh, early hours of the 28th and hope to be in Goose Green by sort of 10, 11 o'clock, um, which was 10 o'clock in Falkland Islands was where it's turning light. OK, so they hoped to be there by, by, by noon anyway. Um, but what happened on the 27th was um, just made people so incredulous. And, and uh, 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 we heard through the... Uh, World Service on the long wave radio, we had 320s. Uh, and we heard the Defence Secretary, John Knott at the time, telling the whole world that 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, was poised, ready to attack the settlement of Goose Green. I, I mean, this is 10 o'clock at night, blind a girl, we're piss wet through. You know what it's like, Chris. You're fucking mm. freezing. You don't know what's going on. Uh, and you hear this through the radio, and it was just unbelievable. Um, it just made everybody so, well, so pissed off, really, because we, our, our position had been compromised and obviously the battle plan had been compromised. And poor old uh, Dave Wood, the adjutant, came out of one of the briefings of Jones uh, and he turned around to a group of guys who were in the stretcher bearer party and turned around and said, gentlemen, the promotional prospects of this battalion will be excellent by tomorrow. 
meaning, you know, we've been compromised, we're going to get fucked. Poor David Wood got killed. He got killed a few hours later. So, so what happened there was, because I was C Company, C Company was half a strength of a battalion, uh, of, of, uh, of a normal rifle company, normally about 120 men in a rifle company. C Company were the eyes and ears, like a mini SAS, and we were sort of uh, Colonel Jones's boys, uh, if you want to put it like that. Um, and there were about four, 50 of us in the company, and we were, we were the patrols and the recce. So we were like the mini SAS, we went and did the recce's. So m- my first task with C Company was to go and recce A Company's start line. Now, for people that don't know what a start line is, it's an imaginary line drawn on the ground, um, far enough away from the enemy not to get compromised, but close enough to the enemy so you can attack it and uh, affect this sort of element of surprise aspect of it all. Uh, and I was point man on that one. So I left about just after 10 o'clock, knowing that John not had told the Argies we were coming. Um, luckily, it was blowing a gale. Uh, I led the guys in. And I was a Tom, private soldier, um, 23, which was an old sweat. Uh, uh, And uh, Ken Rainey, who was my corporal, he was a few years old. He was a full screw. He was in charge of the patrol. He put me at point. I mean, he always did put me at point. (laughs) I don't know why. Uh, uh, So we we got to the start line, set the start line up. And um, we waited. Uh, It took four hours for A Company to be led in. And in the meantime, I heard these tracks uh, and... uh, it turned out to be sort of LVTP7s, which is an American troop carrier, which carried about 20, 20 soldiers. But they then disappeared in the wind. Um, the attack went in into a place called Burnside House. Uh, uh, the Argies had sort of run off, the Argentinians. And then it was, um, we then advanced as reserve company, while B and, D, B and D Company moved onto the right flank, and we were on the left behind A Company. Uh, a Company's next objective was a place called Coronation Point and Darwin Hill. Well, that's when the battle started at Darwin Hill. Um, and it took A Company up until first light, several hours fighting um, to take Darwin Hill. And uh, that's all detailed in the book, first-hand experiences of the Toms, the private soldiers, the Lance Corporals and the Four Screws. Uh, when that battle, when they took Darwin Hill, we advanced through a C Company, as I said, small, a small company of 50 men. We went forward through their position onto a slope overlooking Goose Green, the actual settlement of Goose Green. Now, now the settlement of Goose Green, uh, we didn't know. SAS reports have said that um, it contained 400 Argentinian soldiers, a lot of them um, air, air crew and, and te- technical uh Air fit, uh, air, aircraft fitters, because next to Goose Green was a runway with Pukara aircraft on it. Now, these Pukaras um, were turbojet ground attack aircraft. And I remember distinctly when we were on the Norland sailing down, we got a brief by the Harrier pilots. And the Harrier pilots said, don't worry about the superintendars. We're there below, we're above them. Uh, don't worry about the Mirages. When, when, we're there above us, we get, we get up above them. And then someone shouts out, well, what about the Bacaras, sir? And then this pilot says, oh, don't worry about the Bacaras. Well, as it turned out, they were the ground troops' worst nightmare because they could hover and skit around the place really quick. You know, not just for the parachute regiment in, uh, at Goose Green, but the whole, of the, the whole of the troops on the island. I mean, they scared the shit out of us. So that was quite an ironic thing. Um, so, yeah, we could see the aircraft to our right, and we could see all these sort of ant-like creatures down in Goose Green. Uh, and they were the Argies. They were the Argentinian forces. They looked to be a bit more than 400. Um, and in the community centre, unbeknown to us at the time, but it came through during the battle later on, that there were 119 civilians that the Argentinians had kept uh, hostage in there for three weeks. So we're all looking down. It was about 12 o'clock. And then um, the idea was was for C Company to advance straight down towards Goose Creek, you know, typical sort of Napoleonic-style tactics. Um, and it was like a billiard table, the odd fold in the grass, but it was kind of, you know, it was, it was just grass and um, uh, the odd fold where you really know cover from view or even cover from fire. 
Uh, we got the order to march. Um, once again, they put me at point because <laughs> Ken, Ken was a senior patrol. He was a senior force crew. You know, and I, I guess the boss thought we were kind of semi-professional in our attitude towards war. <laughs> so they put us front. So I can put me point. And we just advanced to contact, as you do, in an arrowhead formation. Uh, that was Recky platoon. Uh, patrol platoon went slightly left. D and B company were over to our right. And they had already advanced. And D company's objective was the airfield. B company then had to swing. B company's objective was Bocker House and then swing around behind Goose Green and hold that ground. Well, that was the plan. Um, so we just advanced to contact. And um, I could see the, the, we closed. As we were closing, um, you know what the drill was back then? It was prepare for battle, which we did. Before we got off, we had a brew and a fag and that. <laughs> no need to camouflage because they knew we, they, they could see us, we could see them. But uh, ironically, I thought, why were the RG shooting at us? And I thought, well, they probably thought that we were them and they had repelled us from Darwin Hill. So that was really strange. Uh, then you uh, you prepare for battle. Then you make sure all your ammunition's all there and your webbing straps are tight and you've got enough bombs on you and stuff. Uh, and then you were uh, what we call advanced to contact. So basically we were advancing to contact an arrowhead formation. And then... Um, you come under what they call effective enemy fire. And that means that if one or two of you get killed, that's not effective enemy fire. You just keep advancing. And then um, you sort of, uh, you, you sort of go to ground if that's the case, if the boss says get down and then you have to attract the enemy fire, but there's no need for that because they knew where we were. Um, uh, and then you just carry on. What happened to us was I could see these uh, flapping tentage type uh, obstacles on our route and um as we got nearer i mean i fixed a bayonet and everybody else fixed bayonets um and fixing a bayonet to an slr an slr is particularly long weapon uh, luckily the bayonet was quite short i think it's about 10 inches long so it, it, it did upset the balance of it um somewhat so we advanced and then this sort of trench affair appeared with this flapping canvas top cover in the wind. So, I mean, I just went in, sort of grenaded it with a white foss. Uh, and we didn't know at the time, but the white phosphorus grenades that we were issued with, well, we called them fuse instantaneous because as soon as you threw them, they went off within a second, which normally a, a grenade is about three seconds, is it? Yeah, three or four seconds, which is quite a long time when you throw a grenade because uh, a lot of things can happen in three or four seconds, but one second <laughs> doesn't give you much chance. So we went in there, um, took, took them out. Well, I took that trench out with the white phosphorus grenade. Uh, and then we advanced and more trenches came, came into view. Because as I said, we're going down a slope and it's, it's undulating and is rolling. So this folds in the ground, which are kind of dead ground until you come up, until you come up on them. Um, and then in the distance, there was this creek and there were bridge. And you could see all the Argentinians running across this bridge, sort of back towards their position, their defensive position. Uh, we hadn't seen Goose Green by then because Goose Green was the other side of this sort of rolling uh, terrain. Um, so we all started firing at them. Uh, we all made a mad dash. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the Argies opened up on us. I mean, it was just a crescendo of small arms, mortars, uh, Orlikan guns, 30 mil cannons. They took the Beaufort guns off the ships and they were firing them at us almost in the ground roll. You know, they were barrels were at one point, their barrels were so... Uh, we were so low that they couldn't fire at us because we were past their point of aim. They caught us on the top slope. Um, so we ran like crazy. And um, that's when plan A went all to cock and you just worked in your small little pairs or your groups of people. And um, our HQ out of 12, because on an arrowhead formation, the HQ sits in the middle of the arrowhead formation about... Um, a safe distance back, normally about uh, uh, 20 or 30 feet, uh, yards, meters back, um, depending on how big the arrowhead formation is or how wide it is. Uh, the guns took them out because we were, I was far forward along with Ken and my patrol. They took out the, um, the command element, which you would do anyway. Uh, and only one guy survived. Uh, Nigel, uh, Holmes Smith was killed, uh, 
Only one guy survived, Dave Charlie Brown, that didn't get injured. And he suffers today because of that. Um, he had to stay in this sort of fold in the ground with, uh, with uh, Mark Holman Smith for about three hours watching this because he couldn't go back because the fire was so great. Um, uh, the boss got the boss got it, although he didn't. Uh, Major Janet he didn't uh, own up to getting f- fragged in the shoulders. The, the rest, all the signals command element went, so they were all fragged and you know injured. And uh, one, two, three, four, really badly injured. You know, I mean, quite bad. I didn't know anything about this until after the battle. So we're pursuing down. We eventually get to the re-entrance, the the estuary bit where the bridge was and all the arges. We crossed there. Um, and unbeknown to us at the time, we were moving into what they call a pick, the pig farm. And that's when the real battle started because the pig farm contained all the upturned styles of these pigs, styles of these pigs, which the Argentinians used as uh, like trenches. They dug those trenches and used it as top cover. Uh, and we were fighting through there. There were a couple of stone buildings. Um, and yeah, it was several hours of well, one, two, three, well, four hours of fighting to the point where you could hear the Spanish voices just like 10 metres away. The D Company came in towards from our right and mingled in with us. Um, yeah, it was all chaotic and there was no sort of game plan apart from advancing to, to Goose Green. And we were taking out these trenches. There was, because uh, you could hear the Spanish voices, it was, it was really off-putting because you were always, you were thinking, where the fuck are they? Because the wind played tricks with you as well. Um, we took out a couple of trench, cu- couple more trenches. Um, I got into a trench where there was, uh, I got into a trench and there was this, I didn't know what it was, but there was an RG. There was a body underneath this uh, poncho and I couldn't get my rifle down because it had the bayonet on, I, you know, because it, it's quite a small trench. So I basically dropped down and, uh, you know, headbutted him or it, whatever it was. I don't know if it was, if it was, if it was dead or, you know, or wounded. I didn't know. But you know, the momentum of the battle, you have to keep going. And also, you can't leave anything behind because you don't want anybody, you've seen it in the old films, they pop up and shoot you, you know. I mean, it's, it's, that, it's that basic. It sounds awful now, looking back at it, but that, that's what it did. You know, you just have to keep going. And um, I bashed this guy in with my helmet unbeknown to me what was going on uh, his mate was dead in the trench there was there was another RG there dead been shot um so we then advanced forward then we come to a stalemate because uh, we couldn't get any further forward because a we were running out of ammunition and uh, b we we didn't have the mount power to do it but then somebody said there was an attack going in on the schoolhouse patrols platoon were going to put this attack on the school and i didn't even know what the schoolhouse was but it was off to my seven o'clock. And I looked around and there it was, this fucking big building. I mean, it was, it was a big, at the time, it was the biggest building on the island. Biggest building. Uh, it was all made of wood. Um, so patrols put this attack in and there was Argentinians out of the windows and, and, and they, you know, the guys went in and stormed. It did a bit of a house clearance. Um, in the meantime, I fired a 66 in order to cover to cover them on the attack, but my sixty six uh, uh, is like a uh, it's a throwaway for your you know for your listeners and viewers it's a it's a throwaway bazooka, okay. Fire one and chuck it away. Anyway, I fired it and it hit the roof of this building and just sort of ricocheted off. And then my mate put another one on it and set it on fire. And then all these uh, Argentinians started, excuse me, all these Argentinians started to come out the back and they were running down the, the beach side of the estuary. Um, of course, the guys were, you know, were firing into them. But later I heard there were about 80 Argentinians in that schoolhouse. Uh, and when it went up, we don't know how many actually uh, survived that. I know a lot of them ran back into Goose Green. Um, that brought us to about uh, two, four, four o'clock, uh, three, half past three in the afternoon. And it gets dark about half past four in the Falklands that time of year. Um, and then uh, we had all these prisoners and there was a bit, there wasn't so much a lull in the battle, but I think we'd sorted out as many of the Argentinians 
which shot as many as we, we could see sort of thing, but we had 20 odd prisoners. Um, but the, 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 the heavy arms firing hadn't died down. They were still mortaring Darwin Hill. They were still mortaring our positions, artillery. Uh, then they flew in special forces in Hueys and a couple of Chinooks. Um, and then with these prisoners, these two Pekaras came round, did an attack, came back again about 10 minutes later, and they, one of them dropped napalm. They dropped a napalm bomb. And it actually dropped about 20 metres from me. Well, no, 20, no, I'd say about 15 metres from me. But it, the momentum went away from me and missed the prisoners, but it singed me. And it cinched a couple of other guys. So that's how close it was. And then that, you know, that combined with John not telling the Argies where we were, that just made us in, I still feel it to this day, it just enraged us. You know, what the hell are they doing dropping napalm? It's just fucking crazy. You know, it's outlawed. Uh, but that was the mentality of us. You know, we, we kind of, I think back then we were, we were morally right soldiers, if that's a, such a phrase. Um, we were trained really well about the Geneva Convention and everything else. Um, so, yeah, I think narrowly missed the prisoners. And then the funny thing was the, the aircraft, the pilot just ejected. Now, you, nobody shot at him. He didn't, uh, he later transpired that he just ejected because he, he, he didn't think he'd make it back to where, to where he was off, you know, where, where he'd come from. And it wasn't goose green. Um, and he floated down into our position. I mean, that's dead weird. And guys were shooting at him and then somebody shouted, don't. And being a paratrooper, you don't want to start shooting people in the air. Um, you don't want to be that victim, do you? <laughs> Coming down and being shot. So he landed right in our position, which was absolutely bizarre. Um, he, got a, he got a bit of a kick in. Uh, someone took his watch off him and his, his gold-plated uh, browning. <laughs> so, you know. Um, and then... We had a lot of wounded. Um, as I say, it gets dark about half four, half past four. And that just after that, we uh, we had a lot of wounded and we had to sort the wounded out. And plus the Argies, we probably had about 30 odd wounded all over the place. Um, and the, the actual intensity of the battle then quietened down a bit. And then the guys, you, you're focused on your own survival, but you're focused on your mates. And, um, and at one instance, uh, uh, my mate with Jock Boland, we were at the estuary just after the schoolhouse, I think it was. And um, someone, he, someone he, sh he shouted, he stood up and shouted, we're, we're being surrounded, we're being surrounded. They're coming around the back, meaning these arges that were all over the place. So as Jock turned, he turned to his left and um, the discarding salvo of a, one of these multi-barrel rocket launchers sliced right across his chest and took him out and... Um, so he was badly injured. We had another guy that was shot in the stomach. I mean, he was really badly injured and he wouldn't stop crying and, you know, screaming for, for, for a couple of hours. So we had to get the, and there was like half a dozen injured from um, D Company that we'd put into this little dairy, this stone building, which incidentally had electric on it. You know, the electric was still switched on. There was this single light bulb. So we put all the, all the uh, casualties in there, <coughs> excuse me, along with the Argentinian casualties, because we treated them just the same. But we couldn't get them out. Some of the walking wounded, as it was getting last light, were marched back up to Darwin Hill in full view of the enemy. Um, and then a scout pilot, John Greenouch, decided to break the ridge at Darwin and come down with another pilot, Rich Walker, scouts, Air, Air Corps, Army Air Corps. Um, he was told not to break the ridge because, you know, it was crazy. You'd get shot down and we don't want to lose any more aircraft. But he came in under heavy fire, um, found out where we were. Uh, Paul Grundy, Lance Corporal Paul Grundy was the radio op and the TYC of our patrol. He brought him in on the radio because we had comms back to brigade because we were the eyes and ears. And, it, you know, we were the old sweats of battalion. Um, we had direct comms back to brigade HQ and, and, and as a consequence had had uh, communications to the air aircraft as well. So uh, John came in very bravely under fire at night, um, went over us, came back again. Uh, Paul Geordie Grundy brought him in on the radio and I brought him in on a flash of a camera that I had. 
and I, and I interviewed John for the book a couple of years ago, and he's got it in his logbook. So it's all it's all been, you know, he, he put it all down right. Anyway, we, he landed, unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. The two choppers landed. They kicked out all the ammunition and rations. They never come in empty, always come in with some kit. And we piled in all the uh, casualties. We put smudge in one of the pods. These scouts had these sort of coffins on the on the skids. They don't have uh, they don't have an undercarriage, uh, a tired undercarriage, rubber, they, a wheeled undercarriage. They have skids, uh, and on top of each skid was a uh, a coffin shaped uh, box. So we put smudge in the one uh, and jock in the other, and um, piled in as many as we could into the back of this scout. And I didn't know this, but it's in John John's logbook, and I can't recall it. But he said I could not take off because there was so much weight on the aircraft that he couldn't take off. So he said, you guys got hold of the skids on both sides and lifted the helicopter up enough so he could get enough lift just to sort of go forward. But he had to go forward towards the Argentinians to get lift. And that's what happened. Him and Rich Walker did that and they turned around. But I... I never, I couldn't recall that. So I must have been one of the guys that was, you know, guard, guarding, do you know what I mean? Like on a cordon of it, as opposed to uh, being one of the guys on the skids. But I didn't know that until two years ago. Apparently it's quite a famous story, but I didn't know about it. So uh, what happened then? Um, when we got rid of our injured, it was, uh, and wounded, um, it was uh, kind of strange really, because the firing died down. The adrenaline had <coughs> slowed down. And of course, then you feel the cold and the effects of what if, what could. And we were expecting a counterattack. Um, so we rifled the Argentinian bodies for any food that we could uh, eat. Uh, the officers had these little bottles of whiskey, believe it or not. So that was uh, so everybody was looking for an officer to. Uh, to, to you know, to get his rations. Took the actually took their ammunition, which is an important part of what was happening because th their ammunition was seven six two long, and they had the better kind of weapon. They had a uh, folding stock SLR, which was semi automatic, which was a better weapon than the ones we had, wasn't it? I mean, SLR you could just single shots, um, so that was kind of good. Um, if we would have been in a NATO situation, we would five five six doesn't fit into seven six two, so we would have been fucked, you know. <laughs> um, because we were really low on ammunition. And, um, well, the thing was, we loaded up and waited for the counterattack. Um, we'd got rid of all our casualties, which is the important thing. Um, but unbeknown to us, Major Chris Keeble, who had taken over command, as I said earlier, of the battalion, got hold of a couple of English-speaking prisoners and sent them down with a white flag into Goose Green and basically said, look, you know... Um, we want your surrender. And uh, and the following morning, that's what happened. Um, thank God, because we were on our chin straps. Because um, we had no support from anyone. We They couldn't get the symptoms and uh, the track vehicles up. We'd, we'd run out of our, uh, mortar ammunition. We had, two, we had two barrels, which was talking to a mortar man in the book, Phil Williams. He said, well, two, two, two barrels was enough. They fired about 800 rounds through them through the two barrels, 800 fucking rounds. He said, but if we had have had four barrels, then we would have fired those 800 rounds quicker and probably wouldn't have been as effective. Um, so, yeah, so we, we had that. We waited uh, for, for uh, we had a very uncomfortable night, couldn't sleep. Uh, people started uh, fires. Uh, and then whispers were going around, you know, who's made it, who's dead, and all that sort of talk um trying to find out who was where was who we, we were all over the place so we didn't know who had been missing or who had been killed and come first light um they 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 surrendered and we thought okay initial reports from the ses said that there were about 400 of these argentinians in there um but because we were the forward troops round goose green we, st we had to keep our position. We had to hold our position just in case there was some kind of counterattack. But the HQ element came in and machine guns, two power machine guns, went in as cover for the uh, command group to take the surrender. And um, we, we just 
gobsmacked as the the actual Argentinians coming out. I mean, there was 20, 30, 50, 100, couple of hundred, 300, 400, five. I mean, it just came out from everywhere. Uh, over 1,200. And, you know, these these lads were, were fighters. You know, they weren't... Uh, uh, they weren't all aircraft technicians, but then again, aircraft technicians are trained in uh, firing a weapon first before they do anything else. Um, so we were astounded by then, and they came out and they dropped all their weapons. And there's that famous picture of all the helmets and all the rifles all in that field there. Um, yeah, and then and that's what that's that's uh, that basically uh, was was the battle from the. Uh, 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 10 o'clock on the 27th through to the morning of the 29th. Now, C Company was the only company really that got into Goose Green. Uh, the others, A Company had to hold Darwin Hill, B and D Company still had to hold their positions around Goose Green. But because <laughs> it was kind of nice because we brought in and we actually uh, we had some uh, top cover. We had, a, we had a cabin to ourselves, which was kind of good. Um, well, I didn't get involved. None of C Company got involved with all the uh, shaking of hands of the civilians and, and, you know, that drink, the famous picture of Hank Hood drinking all the, the vodka and stuff. And, you know, they, they were great times, but I, none of us in C Company were really up to it. We were just absolutely ghost. Um, looking back at it now, I wish I'd done. But your mental position at the time you're still on a war foot and you're still you've still got this kill 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 mentality um and i can still feel it to this day 40 years on but that's what we were and we we didn't drop our guard at all because we knew this was the, the first battle we didn't know how major it was but of course victory begets victory and because everyone that fought in that campaign needed a victory we were so demoralized that the Navy weren't doing, were getting hurt bad. And that, that hurt us on the, on, as ground troops. That really did. We were really, we were really hurt us bad morally. And the troops needed this victory. They needed a moral victory. The whole, the whole of the task force and the people back home needed a victory. Look, it could have been 4-2 commander. You know, it could have been a Scots Guards, but it wasn't. It was 2 power. And um, we got that victory for everyone. And, uh, I think that's what spurred everyone else on to, well, it can be done. We can break them down. All we've got to do is be careful of the Argentine Air Force because they were just incredible. I mean, I was, uh, pilots, you've never seen anything like them, the bravery or the stupidity. Don't know. I'm, I'm sure it was bravery. Yeah. Mate, Colonel H would have been proud of you, wouldn't he? Yeah, I, I'm sure he would. Yeah, yes, he was. Uh, he, he, he didn't take force lightly. And um, as what it's what it's somebody mentions it in the book, he said he said that uh, if Colonel Jones had survived contact, um, there would be few positions, there'd be a few people sacked, and there'd be few open, open positions within the battalion. Mm. And, and there's nothing if you've experienced war and combat. A lot of people go, well, that's fine, that's great. I've had enough of that. I've done my job. You know, I want to I want to get out. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, other people uh, like myself go on and kind of because um, it's all that we know, but kind of sort of, I wouldn't say enjoyed it, but found ourselves quite good at it. Um, and as I, like I said, other, there's other people that go, well, thanks very much. Uh, I did my bit and that's it. And there's other people that realize that uh, they didn't do anything and it wasn't, wasn't for them at all. Mm. Um, and they have to live with that, of course. And there's, that's, that's the way we're all made, isn't it? Um, when I spoke to Jimmy O'Connell, Jimmy was free para, wasn't he? Mount Longdon. Yeah. One wonderful gentleman. Very, very, very nice yeah. man. Mm. Um, when I spoke to him and I said, where's your sleeping bag? Because <laughs> mm. to me, having served, Prior yeah. priorities, isn't it? You know, what's yeah, yeah, what's yeah. gonna keep you alive is a good fucking night's sleep if you can get it. Or or gonna keep you alive as in like you're in you're in minus temperatures down there. And Jimmy <laughs> went, Jimmy said, Chris, we went for a fucking fight. <laughs> we didn't go to sleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so my question, Spud, is where was all like your bergen and everything and all your 
your mm. sleeping gear, you, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of it was stashed up at uh, on top of Sussex Mountains. Um, um, apart from patrol, patrol company was stashed at Sussex Mountains because they were deployed on the task before the whole battalion moved off. Uh, and since I was in a forward OP, I had all my kit. But all the burgers were stashed at Kamita Creek House. Yeah, we fought. Uh, we fought without, without in light order, and patrols platoon fought without their helmets. <laughs> That's why you see pictures of uh, uh, guys in goose green. Some of the pictures they've got their berries on. But well, we all carry our berries. But there's a couple of uh, um, combat pictures of people with their berries on, which is kind of well. It's just you've got to have a helmet on, especially with all that fucking metal flying around. Uh, I don't know how how good they were at the time. I think they were Kevlar. Some of them still had the old tin helmets. But yeah, no, the sleeping bags, all our kit. Mm. We were in light order and we carried everything. And um, there's a moral to the story uh, about all, all incidences in combat. You carry as much ammunition as you can and water. That's all you need. And if you want to and if you want to carry food, you get yourself a, a chocolate bar or something, but you carry white bait. Stick it in the back of your, we in the bottom of your webbing. Something doesn't take up too much. It's salty, isn't it? And, you know, there's a little bit of a taste to it. Uh, and I think lessons like that do get lost, especially when a lot of the military have gone mechanized now. And by that, I mean air calf, they're trucked, cut around in helicopters um, and stuff like that. And they don't go too far away from um, the medics. And you're not too far away from being Kazavaked out. And there's nothing wrong in that. It's just the way the warfare has developed. But there's always a case when you can be caught out and uh, you should always carry as much ammunition as, as you possibly can. And doesn't it weigh a frigging ton? <laughs> yeah. With these smaller ones, these 556 five, uh, uh, rounds, uh, don't, you can carry more of them. But I've told that... Uh, the, uh, there are certain units within regiments now have gone back to 762 because mm. they found that although the 556 is a more accurate, it, it won't put, and the Americans learned this in Vietnam, you know, it killed the enemy, but the enemy would still keep coming and could squeeze, squeeze off the trigger. Whereas the 762 round, if you hit you in the shoulder, it could come out your toe. Yeah. You know, it could rip right, right around your body. I mean, it would put you down, wouldn't it? I mean, it, Seven six two round, so a lot of them, a lot of the infantry units have got have got a unit within seven six two. I know mm -hmm. the SAS have they're developing weapons with seven six two. Yeah, the um, uh, is it not the UKSF the the support uh, the support group they use seven point six two. Yeah, yeah, and they reckon it's because in Afghanistan, if you've got someone running towards you and they're, they're off their head on opium or what, what yeah. and you hit them with 5.56 unless you it's a fatal shot they'll mm. they 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 kept they kept coming yeah. they kept um, coming yeah i wouldn't say 5.56 is more accurate it's the other way around 7.62 mm. over 300 meters is just yeah it's a heavier one yeah, on yeah. the target every time yeah. 5.56 you have to aim off target mm. target with to yeah. make to take allowance for the wind to bring it onto target for you, yeah. Um, obviously, benefits to both the the SAAT is obviously in close quarter battle is the ideal weapon because you, like you said, you can swing it around and yeah. and it's not going to get snagged. Um, on the other hand, it, it, and, and the ammunition's lighter, but I would say it did them all right in Vietnam, but then, like, what do I know? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Well, that's they learned that they learned that the five five six wouldn't put them, wouldn't put them down. Just the example that you gave. Mm. Uh, that that's why now uh, we carry the GPMG seven six two, cracking weapon, and that's why the American Army bin the M sixty and, and went on for a, a, a variation of the M, uh, of the GPMG. Mm. Uh, it's a it's a cracking weapon, cracking round. But yeah, that's um, for. 40 odd years ago for some of us it is uh still there the little bits are still there in the head and for others not so much uh for me i like to think that um research in researching this book has has, has uh, uh made me appreciate more because i was on the front i was at the pointy end and made me appreciate how we got all the logistics from the echelon on the ship 
to the AA Echelon and Sussex Mounted. Appreciated. I appreciate the stretcher bearers. I appreciate the medics. Well, you do anyway, but to actually listen to people's own testimony uh, really brought it home to me. And this is what this book does. It's not about Spud Ely. It's about the guys, the soldiers that fought that battle and where they are now. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a cracking, it is a cracking read. It's the best book I've written. Probably because it's not about me. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what, mate, you've just told that story. Uh, I've been speechless. I think everyone listening has just been utterly, utterly gobsmacked. Uh, uh, it's so engrossing. And I, I, I'm really pleased, but that you're, that you're not suffering too much that you can just come and tell it. And, 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 yeah. you know, it's all, it's all in the past. It's all part um, of the therapy though, isn't it? Of course, you know, we yeah. didn't know, we didn't know if we, what we don't know what's normal us veterans, because when we joined, we were young, we didn't know what we were still developing. We didn't know uh, what normal was. Mm. Yeah, of course. So friends at home, look, uh, Nigel's book, Goose Green, The Decisive Battle of the Falklands War by the British Troops Who Fought It. Um, I'm literally going to get my audio copy now, Spud, because I, uh, I find audio books tend to be easier these days. Although I Let me tell you something. The audio book has been praised. Uh, the narrator is Jonathan Keeble, who's quite a famous audio book narrator and actor. And it, it's been praised. People that... Uh, there's a couple of guys that have been shot, uh, uh, veterans that can't read because of their eyesight and stuff. And uh, they've sent me messages saying, you know, fantastic, really enjoyed it. But what I will say, Chris, is um, I'm making a donation of, on the book sales to Liberty Lodge. Mm -hmm. Liberty Lodge, for those people that don't know, is a, has been built by a Scottish company and it's for returning veterans to the Falklands. Uh, it's like a four or five star lodge. And you stay there and you pay what you think it's worth. People sometimes pay little, sometimes pay a lot. So I want to make a donation to Liberty Lodge. And they've got two four-wheel drive vehicles that the, the um, families and uh, veterans can use to travel around the island. So it's it's kind of a, uh, uh, I, rather than go to a big charity where it could possibly get lost, some of it get lost in uh, admin. And that's what it takes to, to, to run these big charities. The, the Liberty Lodge, uh, I'd like to give them a check direct. We'll put links for all, all for all of your books, Spud, and a link Thank for you. Liberty Lodge below. And of course, we've got an event coming up, haven't we? Which has been a little bit up in the air. Apologies mm. on my behalf. We we got let a, a little bit let down for a venue at the last minute. But friends at home, uh, Spud is very good, kindly going to come and speak on our Falklands Memorial evening. We felt. Um, Luke and I, as, 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 you know, proprietors of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast, we've, we've done so many groundbreaking Falklands podcasts. There's not a lot of people really recording the stories from the guys on, on the ground, um, you know, without the kind of like the BBC narrative, if you understand what I'm saying. So we felt it was our duty to have a Falklands evening Falklands Q and A evening. Obviously, the the um, proceeds will go to 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 charity. Spuds very kindly agreed to come and come and speak. Um, it's uh, we uh, we've got Captain Robert Lawrence from the uh, Scots Guards. Who you've only got to say the the name Tumble Down, and and everyone knows who Robert is. He he's going to come and speak. We've got. Um, Jeff Williams from 4-2 Commando, the taking of Harriet and Mount Harriet and Kent. We've got John Mew, who was on the Coventry when it sunk. It's, oh. it's going to be an emotional evening, but I, I really think that we've got to, you know, we, we've just got to do it. So, so as soon as tickets are available, we'll put them below our videos and we'll put them out through our social media. Um, Spud, that just leaves me, mate, to say once again, Gosh, I'm uh, I'm in your gratitude, mate, um, for my freedom, but also for the for speaking on my podcast. Um, You're welcome, buddy. 
um, I, I know this won't be the last time you're on the podcast, so this is not goodbye. Mm. Um, for f- friends at home, much love to you all. I really, really hope you were as engrossed in this as I was. If you could please like and subscribe. Um, it, it just helps us to uh, keep these stories alive. And, um, you know, what these young men, many of them teenagers, went through, dis- it, it deserves to be remembered. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chris, for your support. My pleasure, mate. My pleasure. Okay.